Okay, so we're going to be introducing the skeletal and muscular system today. So let's start with the skeletal system. So on, in your picture you can see we've got a full skeleton of all the different bones in the human body. The function of bones are to give shape and support, they protect internal organs, and they provide a place for muscles to attach uh, and for movement. Bones also do some things kind of below the surface that you can't see. Um, inside a bone is where uh, red blood cells are, or blood cells are formed uh, in the red marrow. And then the actual hard part of the bone is where calcium and phosphorus are stored. And they're not just planted there uh, and left there. Those uh, calcium and phosphorus can be put into the bone and then taken back out when your body needs it. Um, so in our picture down over here, you've got some of the things coming out of the red marrow and bones, the red blood cells. You've got plasma cells, you've got platelets and uh, white blood cells. Um, I also thought it would be interesting to include, uh, there's a disease called osteoporosis, so as you get older, uh, there's a chance you could get osteoporosis. That's when uh, your bones become fragile. Um, so in elderly people, if they fall down, they might break a bone. Um, it's because of osteoporosis. And what you can see this is an image of a normal healthy bone. Um, this is the matrix formed by the calcium and phosphorus um, uh, forming like a hard uh, bone surface. And then in osteoporosis, your body doesn't lay down calcium as well um, or or phosphorus, so um, it's not able to form a really strong network. Um, you can see all the holes in that bone, um, so those big holes are what make the bone more brittle. Okay, now let's focus in on bone structure. So if we took an individual bone and broke down the, the parts of it, you've got a thing called the periosteum, periosteum, and that's a membrane around the bone, so it's got a little covering um, around the bone. Next time you eat a chicken wing, take a look if you snap it, you'll, um, you, can, you can see that periosteum. Um, and then after that you've got spongy bone, um, and that's towards the end, and it's filled with bone marrow. So spongy bone, it's not the hard part that gives uh, bone, it's like nice dense um, hard support. Spongy bone has uh, yellow and red marrow. Yellow marrow is responsible for making fat cells. Uh, red marrow makes the red blood cells, and it can make two to three million every second in, in a healthy body. Okay, um, so I've got some pictures of internal structures like this throughout some of the videos coming up, so if this sort of thing makes you squeamish, um, you might just want to like cover some of those photos up. Um, but they're really cool to look at if you can uh, um, get yourself to look over. Um, we've got cartilage and ligaments highlighted in this picture. Cartilage um, is what you're going to find at the end of a bone. It's what helps make joints flexible. Cartilage is more, um, uh, there's less friction in between uh, joints with cartilage than there is in a car that uses uh, oil. So your body has this natural, um, natural part that has very, very low friction. There's not a whole lot of rubbing in between the joints, and that's so joints can slide and function well. Uh, and it's the caps at the end of the bone. The other important part about um, bone structure that this part isn't the actual bone, um, it's a ligament and it's the thing that goes from the bone to your muscle. So ligaments are bone to, uh, I'm sorry, bone to bone is ligament. Um, and ligaments hold together things in your knee. So um, if you're a basketball fan, Derek Rose, um, he blew out his knee um, uh, snapped a ligament in his knee um, and you need several ligaments um, your ACL and anterior cruciate ligament um, your MCL there's several ligaments that hold together the joint in your knee and this is an area where basketball players and football players they tend to get injured because they're making sharp cuts and they can uh, damage the um, ligaments in their knee and ligament, again, is bone to bone. They hold bones together. Where would you find a ligament? In your knee. 
Your knee is just a, a bony joint, and it's got ligaments in it. Okay, any place where bones are coming together is a, forms a joint. And in your picture over here on the right, you've got some types of joints found in the human body. They basically come in two categories, immovable and movable. And it's just like they sound. Immovable joints are like the ones in your skull, and movable joints are anywhere from your elbow to your knee to your spine. I got another picture of a skull here. So when you're young and you're developing, this is actually cartilage, um, and the bone plates haven't fused together in your skull. As you reach adulthood, those bone plates fuse together. So um, there is a joint there, it just doesn't move. There's no flexibility. Now let's look at some types of movable joints. Um, you've got ball and socket, uh, and that's going to give you a wide range of motion. It's where uh, any your shoulder, your hip, or uh, where your thigh comes into your hip are both ball and socket joints. A pivot joint is when one uh, bone rotates in a ring, and you can turn your head like that, and you're operating a pivot joint. A hinge joint would be for back and forth movement, so um, moving your elbow, kicking your leg um, would be using a hinge joint. And gliding joints are bones that slide over each other. So that's your ankle and your wrist would be examples of gliding joints. Okay, now we're going to look at muscle. Uh, so muscle is going to be function, functioning in movement. So we've got our little runner there with all of the muscles visible. Um, and there's two types of muscle. There's voluntary muscle and involuntary. We're going to start with voluntary muscle. These are the ones that you can control. Um, any of your skeletal muscles, so anything, if you move your fingers, you move your um, forearm, you move your bicep, flex your bicep, your tricep, um, your chest, any muscles that you can consciously control are your voluntary muscles. Also call these skeletal muscles, and they're what attaches um, the bones to your muscle, or they're, I'm sorry, they're the muscles that are attached to your bones. The thing that attaches muscle to bone is a tendon. I want you to reach down and grab uh, your Achilles tendon and squeeze it, and you're going to think Achilles tendon. Your Achilles tendon, if you follow it, attaches into the ball of your heel, that bony structure down in your heel, and if you follow it back up, it goes straight to your calf muscle. So tendon is muscle to bone. And then just for fun, I put this picture over here, and it just shows if you to go from the large structure of a muscle, and then you break it down into each of its individual parts, uh, down to the part that actually does the flexing, that's um, the sectioning of a muscle. Um, so for this picture here, you don't have to know this. This is just for fun. So if you were writing all this down, you don't have to write it all down. It's just for fun. Um, now let's look at some involuntary muscles. These are a little bit less intuitive um, and you might not be as familiar with. Involuntary muscles are ones that you cannot control. Example of this would be if you put your hand over your heart, um, your cardiac muscle, it's involuntary. Um, a neat thing about cardiac muscles is that if you grew them in a Petri dish, they would have a heartbeat, um, so they'd be flexing. If you put one cardiac muscle that was beating near another one, they would start to sync up their, their beating motion, so they would beat at the exact same time. Um, so that's kind of a fun part of cardiac muscles. Um, smooth muscles are um, found in your organs. They're involuntary, so the thing that causes your muscle to move and flex to aid in mechanical digestion um, or that moves food through your system uh, would be smooth muscles. And then over here, Here's an example. This is what a cardiac muscle cell looks like, and this is what a smooth muscle cell looks like. And the very last thing that we're going to cover um, as a little bonus surprise is this integumentary system, and that's your skin. It's a big word. It just means your skin. It is the largest organ in your body, so it's a really fun like uh, quiz question you can ask people. What's the largest organ in your body? And people might say, oh, it's your liver, or um, it's your gallbladder, or uh, they might name any number of organs. But it's actually your skin. Um, it does a bunch of things. The first thing, it protects your body. So you've got this uh, barrier that keeps 
bacteria and viruses and diseases from getting inside of you. Uh, your skin can get rid of waste, um, forms vitamin D, and it serves as a site for senses. And what that means is that you need some place for your nerves to go into, to be attached to, and that place is your skin. If you didn't have it, I don't really know. I can't imagine what kind of surface you would have, you, you, but you need something. If you're going to have a sense of touch, you need uh, that surface of your skin so that your nerves can be inside of your, um, or, or that you have a place for those nerve cells to go. All right, skin has two layers, epidermis and dermis. Epidermis is the outer thinnest layer. Um, it's actually just composed of dead cells. They're water repellent and you've got melanin. Um, that's the thing that's gonna give your skin color. Um, the melanin um, are gonna be the cells that secrete the chemical to provide color. Um, the function of that color is it helps to absorb UV light rays. So your, the melanin produced in your epidermis helps as a sunscreen for you. Your dermis is the layer below the epidermis. It's thicker, um, contains the blood, hair, sweat, uh, hair, nerves, oil, and sweat glands. Um, and then below the dermis layer is a layer of fat. And so I've got um, some examples. You can see epidermis, dermis layer with the skin, and then your fat cells below that. Um, if you burn yourself, if you just burn the upper layers of your skin, you're okay. Um, but third degree burns, when you burn yourself severely, you start to damage below into the dermis and below into the fat layer. And that's really bad for you because as we talked about earlier, your skin is that protective barrier. If you get a third degree burn, you remove that protective barrier and then you're very susceptible to getting um, uh, infections and diseases. Um, and problems from that, so complications from that skin burn. All right, and that's the end. Uh, see you in class.